Hello everybody. Welcome to the Antibody Society webcast series on antibody validation. In this, the sixth episode of the series, we're going to look at two of the most commonly used validation technologies, Western blot and immunohistochemistry. They are, they are commonly used, but are they as routine as they seem? The Antibody Society is an international nonprofit association. We're an international forum for facilitating discussion, disseminating information, providing guidance and assisting in training and advancement of students and postdoctoral fellows. So if you care about antibodies, please do join the society. The speakers in this webcast series are experts from academia and industry. They're expressing their independent assessments. They're not representatives of the society. Viewers can write in questions at any time during the original broadcast for the speakers to answer and the speakers will remain online for 15 minutes after the cast has finished for you to type in your questions. In this episode, I'm very happy to be able to welcome Professor Aldrin Gomes and Professor Jim Trimmer, both from the University of California, Davis. And Aldrin will focus on the complexities of Western blots, while Jim will talk about immunohistochemistry, on, particularly on brain tissue, which is a notoriously difficult target. Greetings, Aldrin. Greetings, Jim. Thank you very much for joining us today. Western blotting was invented nearly 50 years ago, and it's such an everyday technique. Protein mixtures separated on electrophoresis shells are transferred to the surface of, of adsorbent carriers, and then antibodies are incubated with the carrier and bound antibodies detected. Surely we don't need to consider that as a potential problem area, or do we? Aldrin, your team have an analyzed the use of Western blotting technology in the literature. Could you describe some of the issues which, which you've come up against? Yes, it's really good to be here and thank you for inviting me. I think it's important because Western blotting is such a commonly used technique and antibodies are so important. So uh, an important aspect of Western blotting is that it's routine. A lot of people take it for granted. However, there are some common pitfalls that people need to be aware of and need to take into account. Some labs have done this, but many labs have not. So for example, there's one major concern in the Western blotting field, and that's the antibody. And that's the area of this whole uh, series of webcasts. It's about the antibody. And this is the most important thing uh, that causes irreproducibility in Western blotting. So an antibody is something that is critical because it allows us to detect the target. And the most important pitfall is that antibodies are not validated for specific Western that it's going to be used for. By this, we mean each antibody needs to be validated for the specific tissue and amount of total protein that is going to be used. For example, if we are using rat heart and an antibody has been validated for rat heart, it will work great for that. However, if you're going to use it now in mouse heart, you have to independently validate it for that mouse heart because each tissue have different cell-specific post-translation modifications. There are modifications on these uh, proteins that you may be targeting that may be causing the antigen and antibody interaction to be different between these different tissues. So we have to validate it specifically for every different tissue you're gonna use. On top of that, if we validate an antibody to use at 15 microgram of total protein, for example, in rat heart, if we now go and use 30 microgram of total protein, this is not validated for 30 microgram. We have to independently validate it now for that 30 microgram. A second important concept is that antibodies need to be validated for each technique it's going to be used. So if an antibody is good for Western blotting, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good for immunohistochemistry and vice versa. If an antibody is being used for flow cytometry, that doesn't mean it's going to be good for Western blotting. It has to be specifically validated for Western blotting. Another important concept is that these antibodies, when they are not validated, can result in significant artifacts. For example, you can see here that in these experiments that were done in my lab, when we use anti-ISG15 antibodies, and we use some six different antibodies, we can see only two giving us the same result, these two here. And it's possible that these two may be the same antibody because companies routinely sell to other companies and they repackage it and resell. The concern here is that 
we can get five different results depending on which antibody we use. And here we are trying to determine is ISG-15 increased or decreased or didn't change between young and old rat hearts. And we couldn't tell because we didn't have the proper controls, positive and negative controls, and the antibodies were giving us such different results. So using unvalidated antibodies can result in unexpected and in many cases misleading results. As you can see now in the next example from another group, they showed that using three different antibodies, so antibody one, antibody two, and antibody three, they can get different results in wild type and knockout animals, depending on the antibody they use. And they came to a conclusion that I fully agree with, although it's painful, the importance of stringent antibody validation. You have to validate that antibody and use stringent validation. It's very important. Otherwise, you result in results which you cannot reproduce because the antibody you chose may not have been the correct antibody. Now, people assume that if they get a validated antibody from a company, that they will get good results. In some cases, they would. But in some cases, that validated antibody, if used incorrectly, will give misleading results also. For example, we're using one of our best antibodies in our lab, which is the protosome subunit. And if we use that one to, 50, one to 5,000 versus one to 50,000, that's a tenfold difference. We see different results, as you can see down here. So the antibody concentration must be optimized for the target itself. It's very important. So amount matters. So even using validated antibodies, you have to validate the amount of that antibody you need to use to get linearity. So uh, if we take a look now at other pitfalls, a lot of us don't use positive and negative controls when using new batches of a previously validated antibody. If an antibody we got two years ago worked great, but that finished, we got a new batch of antibody, we have to independently validate that antibody again. Because we have seen in our lab that batch to batch variation is quite large, especially with some companies. There's also a lot of problems with usability due to lot to lot, especially uh, antibodies made in rabbits because they're polyclonal antibodies. And these polyclonal antibodies typically are not appropriately affinity purified. Even some of anti purified antibodies, we have found to have multiple antibodies still in there. So it typically it's a heterogeneous mixture, and they typically rep uh, can recognize epitopes on the target, but also recognize non-selective epitopes. So they're able to give us artifacts that we don't want. So again, we have to be able to take that into account and be aware of that. Also important is other aspects of Western blotting. So moving on, you can see that sample preparation, most of us don't have that on our radar for Western blotting, but we have found that sample preparation is overlooked and it's also a source of irreducibility. If we look at cytosolic fractions and we look at total cellular extracts, this includes mitochondria and nuclear uh, fractions together with the cytosolic fraction, we get different results. Whether it's housekeeping proteins or certain target proteins, we get different linearities. So for example, if we're using 15 microgram of total protein, all of them may be great. When we go to 30 microgram, only certain proteins in the cytosolic fractions may still be working. All the housekeeping proteins were no longer linear, and for total cell extracts, even our target proteins were no longer linear. So we have to be careful what we're using and validate for that. We can't assume that if we did total protein and validate an antibody for that, it will work the same way for mitochondrial proteins by itself, or nuclear proteins by itself, or cytosolic proteins by itself. So loading and normalization is another common area that we have some problems and that's because 95 or more 95 percent or more of people who do western blotting right now rely on housekeeping proteins my lab does not use housekeeping proteins because we found that it takes too much time to keep validating them and we found in over 50 percent of the westerns that we do housekeeping proteins were not linear this is an independent study done by eton et al and they found that when tubulin is used as the housekeeping proteins, it's only linear to less than 10 microgram of total protein. You can see here the graph showing linearity up to about eight microgram. So basically, if you're using 10 microgram or more of total protein, in their hands, they found that this was no longer linear, meaning that the results will give you artifacts or irreproducible results because the housekeeping protein, tubulin, 
was becoming saturated by 10 microgram. And this has been shown by other labs, including my labs. We have found that actin uh, is not as linear as we thought, but this is a good paper here where they found that they were looking at normal and T stands for tissues that have tumors in them. And you can see here that actin is changing, tubulin is changing, and GAPDH can change. So these house heaping proteins that we assume were highly expressed and were not changing, now we're realizing they actually change depending on certain conditions. And we now know that they change due to tissue age and type, their developmental changes that cause these housekeeping proteins to change, their post-translational regulation that causes them to change, their changes in different cell types and experimental conditions also affect them. So these housekeeping proteins are not as stable as we once thought. In, in this case, you can see just the tumor tissue, these housekeeping proteins are changing drastically. So again, these housekeeping proteins are usually highly expressed whereas our target proteins are often only expressed in low abundance, and this leads to them becoming saturated at a lower amount of total protein than the target protein. So what we use in our lab is a total protein method, which has its flaws too, in that it above 60 microgram of total protein, it cannot be used, but we find it better than uh, housekeeping protein. So in this case, in this example done by this group, Taylor et al., they're using stain-free, and stain-free is a technique similar to Ponso in that it measures total protein. Here, it's a, a dye, it, it's a fluorescent tag that's been labeled onto proteins, uh, the tryptophan residue, and you measure every single band here. So you're measuring every protein. Instead of relying on one protein as a housekeeping protein, you're relying on every protein here. So any changes in one protein is not going to bias significantly your result. So here, we take the sum of all the proteins and we're able to get a better linearity, as you can see here in the green. While you can see for beta actin, G, PDH, and beta tubulin, uh, before 20 micrograms, the linearity is significantly um, lost. So um, Ponso also gives us similar linearity of about 50 microgram, and we routinely use Ponso or total protein staining by stain three, and we found it works really well. Now, another aspect that causes problems is our analysis. And you can see in the next slide that uh, the, a lot of people don't realize that technical replicates are important. Why? Because one person may get one result, another person may get another result. In my lab, we often have two different people doing the same experiment using the same biological replicates, and that helps us identify variations in the technique itself because different people do things slightly differently. Some people leave a longer time, some people use a slightly different buffer, they may be buffering correctly. So these things are really important to allow for reproducibility of the technique itself. We have seen that using software programs that are incompatible with your imaging system will give results that are different. So we suggest using software programs that are compatible for your imaging system. We suggest minimize image processing. If possible, do no image processing because we have seen times where people do image processing and do converting of files and that causes artifacts in the results. So lack of both technical and biological replicating sample in experimental design will result in less reproducibility of your results. So in the next slide, you can see here that there are other things that prevent people from reproducing what other people. So for example, if we look at the literature right now, and we try to reproduce more than 60% of articles we cannot reproduce immediately because they're lacking key things. They're lacking the antibodies they actually use, where they were from, their lot number, their catalog number. They're lacking what they actually use as their buffer. And we have found these things to be absolutely critical. So for example, in these experiments here, you can see uh, from our lab, just changing from tris buffered saline with 20 to phosphate buffered saline with 20 we get huge differences in the sensitivity. So you can see here, the linearity changes drastically. And PBS given significantly more signal and causing us to have to use a lot less protein if we're using PBS. So using different simple things that we consider, just changing from TBS to PBS causes drastic changes in your results. So you have to be aware of that and you have to take that into account when you're validating your antibody as well as when you're doing your Western blots. In the next slide, 
you can see that the most commonly used method now is with chemiluminescence using a CCD imager. And that's good because a small percentage of labs still use X-ray film and chemiluminescence. However, X-ray film is inherently biased in that we cannot tell when it's saturated. So on top of that, the linearity of the results is very low. So you're more likely to get saturated results using X-ray film than using an imager. The images also allow us to see. They normally give a red signal or a band to show you when there's saturation. So this is important because saturation is something we have to take into account because once bands are saturated, we have no linearity and we're not able to get reproducible results. So we encourage people who are using X-ray film to seek out other people nearby who are using CCD images and start using that technology as it will reduce the amount of false uh, um, positives and errors that they get. In the next slide, we now come to a summary of the main factors. And the main factors are that antibody validation is needed for each specific condition that you're doing. If you're doing rat liver, you need to validate it independently from rat heart. You have to validate for the amount of protein you're gonna be doing. You have to validate for the buffers you're gonna be using. So validation is critical. On top of that, sample preparation is also very important. We need to not just prepare samples uh, in a certain way, but we need to report how we prepare those samples. We have found that using certain things like urea can affect our downstream applications. So once you report that, other people can then reproduce the results you got using the same conditions. We also uh, wanna make a big push that people start validating their housekeeping proteins better or switch to total protein. For example, Journal of Biological Chemi Chemistry now recommend that you use two housekeeping proteins. We tried that and found it too onerous, and we found that in some cases, even two were giving us artifactual results. So we personally find it's a lot easier and cheaper to use total protein than housekeeping protein. But it's fine to use housekeeping proteins once you validate that that housekeeping proteins that you're using is linear under the conditions that you're using. Thank you. Great, Aldrin. Thank you very much indeed. I think uh, this is really an excellent example that shows that even very common validation technologies can be more challenging than they appear at first attempt. Um, I'm particularly fascinated by the, the different non-linearities in the technique. So it's it's fascinating that the, the housekeeping proteins, of course, somehow we know that they're differentially regulated but to see it so dramatically is fascinating and also in the detection technologies I find it sort of fascinating that the you know people people tend to forget that there's a cutoff or that the software might not be linear or is cutting out parts of the signal I think it's a real a real challenge and people have to be aware of these things and I think your talks really highlighted that Yes, that's a very important aspect. But the good news is that software is continuously being upgraded. Many of the software we use, every year they update and they get better and better. Five years ago, the softwares are nowhere near as good as the software we have now. So the software now can really detect saturation very easily and it shows you. You have to turn it off manually actually for many of the new software. I think this is an excellent example that shows that even very common validation technologies can be more challenging than they appear at first sight. One important thing to remember is that in the data sheets, the suppliers will describe a specific Western block protocol under which the antibody you have bought may have been validated. That may well not be the same protocol you routinely use. For example, it is often not clear if the blotter has used nitrocellulose or PVDF paper, used the wrong one, and the antibody may well not work. Nitrocellulose is hydrophilic while PVDF is hydrophobic, so the proteins absorb in entirely different orientations and are differently denatured and presented on the paper surfaces. And we consider Western blot to be an easy technique. Well, that can't be said of immunohistochemistry. First used in the 1940s to detect bacteria in tissues, it's now a ubiquitous technique in preclinical and pre clinical sciences, especially since it was revolutionized by the antigen retrieval technologies of Xi in the late 1990s. But many aspects of immunohistochemistry remain very subtle, 
and it remains both an art and a science. So it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome James Trimmer, Distinguished Professor of Physiology and Medicine at UC School of Medicine, who is one of the uh, leading pr practitioners of, uh, of the subtleties to guide us through some of the traps to be avoided. Jim works on brain tissue, which is difficult even as an immunohistochemistry target. Greetings, Jim. Thank you very much for joining us today. Jim, you set up the Neuromab facility for producing and validating high quality research antibodies for neurosciences. Could you tell our viewers about your experiences with validating antibodies for immunohistochemistry? Um, thank you, Simon. Yes, uh, today I'll be discussing validating antibodies for immunohistochemistry, a widely used application for which antibody validation has unique challenges, but which also offers unique opportunities for effective antibody validation. Antibody validation for IHC falls under the same basic consideration as for validation in other applications. First and foremost is that antibodies should be considered fit for purpose and not all purpose reagents. This means that antibodies need to be validated in the specific applications and under the specific sample preparation conditions in which they will then be used. We have performed hundreds of monoclonal antibody projects over the last few decades, and our results consistently support that antibodies are not all-purpose reagents. Here's a summary of results from a typical project in which we validated a set of 96 ELISA-positive monoclonal antibodies in multiple applications. It's clear that validation in one application, for example, Western blotting, the blue hatch subset, would yield a skewed perspective for how these antibodies would perform in other applications. If we add in another application, in this case, array tomography, a form of IHC in which samples are embedded in plastic, we see a similar trend in that validation in one application does not have much predictive value for the other applications. This leads to the overarching consideration that validation of antibodies to be used in IHC must be done by performing IHC in the native tissue itself. One reason for this is that the antigen in the native situation likely contains tissue-specific post-translational modifications and protein-protein interactions that may impact antibody access to epitopes. This, these may not be present in overexpressing cells and are certainly not present in bacterially expressed and purified protein such that validation in these samples will likely not directly translate into valid use of these antibodies for IHC and tissue. As another example, denaturation of tissue samples for Western blots will eliminate protein-protein interactions and alter protein conformation relative to that present in native tissue and make validation in Western blotting difficult to translate into IHC. The bottom line is that antibody validation for IHC needs to be done using IHC. One important and powerful method for antibody validation for IHC is to compare the pattern of antibody labeling in tissue to an antibody independent method that defines a spatial pattern of antigen expression in that tissue, an approach known as orthogonal validation. This is best performed in a tissue in which different cells express differing levels of the antigen. We work in BRAIN, which provides an especially complicated yet powerful system for antibody validation due to its extreme cellular complexity. It can also present unique challenges due to the extreme morphological complexity of the neurons themselves, which have long and extensive dendritic and axonal processes. The example that I show on the upper right is a fairly simple one, showing in the top panel, the in situ hybridization signal for RGS14 mRNA in the hippocampus region of the brain, with the highest, of, highest levels of mRNA shown in red. In the lower panel, antibody labeling for the RGS14 protein is also shown in red. Note the strong signals for both mRNA and protein and antibody labeling in the same small CA2 subregion of the hippocampus. Although note that while the mRNA is limited to the cell bodies, there is additional labeling that ex for antibody that extends into the dendrites of these cells. The example on the bottom is a bit more complex in that the bulk of the mRNA signal, as shown in the left panel, 
is in the red box outlining the midbrain. While the antibody labeling shown in the right hand panel has substantial additional signal in the blue box outlining the striatum. However, this antibody labeling in the striatum is not nonspecific labeling, but specific labeling of the nerve terminals located at the end of axons that project from the midbrain dopamine neurons whose cell bodies contain the mRNA over to their target neurons in the striatum. This example emphasizes that orthogonal, orthogonal validation for IHC must be supported by knowledge of the anatomy of the tissue in which it is being performed. As you will hear about in the next webinar, genetic validation is an important and especially powerful tool for validating antibodies. For IHC, this is typically performed on matched tissue samples from wild type and knockout mice. The key is that the entire IHC experiment is performed identically between the paired wild type and knockout samples. On the left are two examples of brain sections from wild type and knockout age and sex match litter mates prepared under identical conditions, immunolabeled with the same antibodies, with the target antibody in red and the marker antibody in green, and then imaged identically. Note that in both cases, the elimination of red target specific signal in the knockout, supporting that this signal is specific to the target protein. The upper right-hand panels show brain sections labeled with two antibodies that in wild-type mice show a layered pattern of labeling in the cortex. This, the individual single knockouts show selective elimination of the green and red signals respectively, while, the double, while in the double knockout, both signals are eliminated. Finally, the grayscale panels show genetic validation of two different antibodies the one on the left passed, and the one on the right failed. As you may know, there are many high profile examples of such failures in the literature, as well as many successes. These examples show the power of genetic validation for validating antibodies for IHC, as performed on paired samples prepared under the same sample preparation conditions. This is an important consideration as arguably more than any other technique, sample preparation conditions for IHC can fundally, fundamentally impact the antibody labeling that's obtained in tissue samples. Sample preparation, including fixation, alters the biochemical properties of the target antigen, as well as the physical nature of the tissue itself. As schematized in the right panel, aldehyde-based fixatives such as formaldehyde shown here, as well as glutaraldehyde, cross-link amine groups present on lysine side chains and on the peptide backbone. The fixation reaction can directly occlude antibody binding to its epitope by ch chemically modifying these sites in the epitope itself. The reaction can also indirectly interfere with antibody access to its epitope by stabilizing biological or fixation-induced protein-protein interactions or specific protein conformations that are then not recognized by the antibody. Fixation can also generate protein-dense subcellular compartments or even entire tissue sections in which antibody penetration is impeded. The lower left graphs show a summary of data showing that longer fixation times, typical of pathology samples, reduce labeling with a set of monoclonal antibodies initially validated on more lightly fixed tissue, emphasizing the importance of defining and transparently reporting the precise conditions used for antibody validation, including on antibody data sheets from suppliers, as antibodies validated under one fixation condition may not perform under others. In certain cases, the effects of fixation can be reversed by antigen retrieval, as in the case of the red antibody labeling shown here. Note that labeling with the green antibody is relatively unaffected by antigen retrieval. Such treatments need to be coupled to orthogonal or genetic validation to ensure that the signal that appears upon antigen retrieval is in fact specific. <clears throat> 
The last example I show is antigen retrieval employing treatment of fixed brain sections with the protease pepsin. The top rows show labeling in wild type mouse brains without and with and without and with pepsin treatment. The no pepsin sample has diffuse but specific antibody labeling to the target protein that's expressed in numerous but very small presynaptic terminals that are spread throughout the section. Antigen retrieval with pepsin reveals the prominent population of target protein present on the axon initial segments, a subcellular compartment with specialized lipids in an extremely dense protein composition and which is difficult to penetrate with antibodies. While the lack of either labeling pattern in the knockout samples shows that both are specific, the one on the left is incomplete, providing an example of the potential disconnect between the presence of immunoreactivity versus the presence of the actual antigen. I refer webinar attendees to this excellent article by Lorenz and Nusser on antibody validation for IHC. In conclusion, it is critical to focus on validating antibodies for use in specific applications and using specific sample preparation conditions, and then reporting these conditions transparently so that your work can be reproduced and extended. Sample preparation and especially fixation has substantial consequences on efficacy and specificity of antibody labeling in IHC, and orthogonal and genetic validation approaches are especially useful for IHC, but need to be combined with these above considerations to be effective. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Jim. I know that anyone who's done immunohistochemistry chemistry understands the complexities of the technique, but it's still amazing how such a commonly used method is so prone to both antibody and, and of course, sample preparation artifacts, especially uh, especially for, for beginners who aren't aware of the depths of the uh, the problem. And that's a, a very very nice. Uh, description of the issues. Thank you. Um, I wonder, do you have a, a final word of guidance for the viewers? Um, I think one of the keys is to very carefully read method sections of papers and also um, interrogate as much as possible either the data sheets or the technical support from antibody developers and really try to get um, at a very granular level the details of the methods that are used so that you can reproduce those methods in your own lab or even be aware uh, when you intentionally decide not to reproduce those and, and use a different approach um, so that you have some idea of, of what may um, be the consequences of doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So, so we see that even very common validation technologies can be taxing to use correctly. In the next episode, we'll look in depth at some of the most valuable validation technologies. Uh, we've heard from Jim about the, cell, uh, the tissue knockouts in animals, and we will now, in the next episode, look in more depth at gene knockout technologies. This is the Antibody Society webcast series on antibody validation. The Antibody Society series on the validation of commercial tool antibodies would be impossible without the generous financial support of our corporate sponsors. If you have a question about routine but not trivial validation in practice for Professor Holmes and Professor Trimmer, please type them in now at the question and answers tab.